Good evening and welcome to this exclusive subscriber event with the wonderful Christy Watson. I'm Bryony Gordon. A few things before we get started. If you want to make us bigger, full screen, there's a little box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, or there should be. If there's not, I'm terribly sorry about that. And then also, if you want to ask questions throughout the event, um, if you scroll down, there you can add them and they will be fed through to me on this iPad. And then in the last 20 minutes, we will ask Christy all your questions. Um, so Christy, welcome. Um, just in case you don't know about her, <coughs> you should. She's a writer and professor of medical and health humanities at UEA. Her first book, Tiny Sunbirds Far Away, won the Costa First Novel Award. The Language of Kindness, published in 2018, was a number one Sunday Times bestseller. Oh, I shouldn't have mentioned that. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was translated into 23 languages and adapted for theatre. In 2020, during the first peak of the pandemic, Christy published The Courage to Care and brief briefly returned to clinical work as a nurse. Now, she is tackling the messy magic of midlife in her new book, Quilt on Fire. Christy. Hi. This book... It starts with you climbing into a fish finger freezer. Oh, well, which I nearly did today because it's been so hot. Yeah, I, I just thought I could climb back into that freezer today. Definitely. Yeah. So tell us about the because it starts with you not to spoil a thing. Yeah. But it starts with you climbing into a fish finger freezer mm. and sort of ends with you in a skip. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I didn't realise those bookends were very apparent. Which I felt subconscious. Very relatable. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was feeling really lost. Just I, I sort of felt dissociated outside my own skin. I felt quite invisible. I didn't feel like myself. I felt just really uneasy and not didn't know what was wrong with me. But I knew something was very, very wrong with me. And I was in Sainsbury's and just walking around, sort of wading through treacle is how I would describe how I was Not walking. literally. Not literally, <laughs> metaphorically, but just chucking random stuff into the um, trolley and watching all these other women that I thought were getting it absolutely right. Sort of aggressively ticking their meal planners and just thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be one of these women. And I got really hot, bothered. And then I just found myself climbing into the fish finger freezer and a man actually next to me just didn't even look at me and just took some breaded cod out from the freezer next door. And I thought, this is really not normal at all. So I ended up um, in therapy, mm -hmm. which was a really great thing. And my therapist said, you've got a lot going on, but this sounds a lot like perimenopause. And that's where the book sort of came from, really, that journey into understanding what perimenopause means for me. It's interesting because obviously there's a lot of talk about menopause yeah. now. And <coughs> I kind of, I feel, but I, the, the perimenopause is quite a new thing, I think, for a lot of us to get our heads around. And I mean, this book is, it, I, I need, it really you know, it resonated and related to me as someone who's just started covering themselves in HRT patches. And I thought at 42, I was too young for that. But it turns out, absolutely, no, I'm, I'm a completely the right age for all of this. But we don't, we really don't talk about this stuff enough, do we? Mm. I, I think, I think that's it. I think that there, there is obviously a really much needed growing movement of conversation around menopause. Mm. But I didn't know this thing perimenopause could start and does start 10 years earlier from when your periods stop. So I'm still getting periods very regularly. For example, I was 42 in the book and that's when my, my symptoms escalated to the point where I couldn't function. Um, and all my friends around me started to look like they were falling apart <coughs> in some way as well. And so it felt very much like something that was happening to women in our late 30s and 40s as opposed to the menopause, which I'd always imagined, I'll deal with in my 50s. Mm. You know, that's not yet. And yeah, it's just this sort of period of time that I, I, I think has been a bit neglected in public conversation, really. Well, I sort of think all th that sort of female health stuff is just neglected. And I wonder how much, because obviously we hear a lot about hot flushes, night sweats, but that is not, that's not the, that's not all of it. And no. what this book does so well is it really sort of um, targets the emotional piece of perimenopause mm. and how much it completely messes with your mind. 
Um, and I, I re that really came across to the point I read it and I thought, oh my God, I'm not going mad. I mean, this is, this is the thing, like, the, it's quite serious. You know, you, mm. you, you, you quote, you, you know, the whole way through you quote statistics. Um, women aged 45 to 49 have the highest suicide rate yeah. um, in all of uh, in all age groups. You know, this is really serious stuff, and yet mm. it gets complete. It, it sort of is only now rising to the surface. Yeah, and really high divorce rates, and there's all sorts of statistics that when you start linking the dots between what's happening with perimenopause, which is when your hormones are fluctuating to such a great degree that, you know, for me, my symptoms were primarily mental health. Mm -hmm. It was just really, really poor, almost catastrophic mm -hmm. mental breakdown. And I had no idea that hormones could do anything like that. I was, like you said, imagining a few hot flushes, some rage, a bit more rage. <laughs> but I didn't get that. I just felt like I was absolutely losing my mind, losing my identity, losing my sense of self. And, and I think... What's been really interesting for me, philosophically thinking about it, is that every woman's experience is completely unique. And I do know people who are sailing through this time of life. Mm -hmm. And I know older women who say they've had no symptoms whatsoever. And if they did, they did a bit of exercise and they felt better. And so the range, I know, <laughs> I know, I hate them. Um, but the range of experiences seems to be fascinating. And, um, and I wonder about... Uh, unprocessed trauma and it seems to correlate a lot with you can have really debilitating symptoms of perimenopause and mental health issues around this age and this time if maybe you had a rocky adolescence mm -hmm. or if maybe you had something that's gone on before which most of us have but that seems to be what I'm seeing in, in me and my friends is that, that those of us that had a really difficult time hormonally mm -hmm. when we were teens are now Lo and behold, having a difficult time hormonally at midlife with all the responsibilities that come with being in a woman, you know, a woman in our 40s with caring responsibilities, financial stuff, work, all the other stuff mm. crashing in and parenting. And pa <laughs> Let's not forget that, <laughs> which you go into so much about your two children. And then <clears throat> that thing, we know, obviously, we all know that hormones affect our mood. Like we've, as women... <clears throat> Most of us have spent our whole lives, you know, having anything, you know, if we express an emotion that's anything other than kind of passive, we, you know, we're, oh, you're probably, on, she's just hormonal, you know, but it, it really shocked me, it has really shocked me, ha just how much hormones have an effect on your mental health. And the, and the interesting thing is that you, you know, this could be, uh, a, a, this could be an extended whinge, but it's not. And, you know, you sort of start with the what's happening me, with me. I'm climbing into a, a, a fish finger freezer. Mm. Um, and you go through this whole process where you sort of, you muse on whether menopause is actually in this time of life is, as you say, that it's a way of dealing with all the unprocessed stuff that we spent so long sort of dampening down and ignoring. And it is a way, it is the change. You think, you, you talk about how you think that's a much better term mm. for the menopause and how it sort of moves you into the next stage of your life. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a forced reckoning, isn't it? It really is. For me, that's how it felt. And I feel like it also speaks to this pandemic time that we're still living in because we've sort of climbed a mountain and we're at this vantage point where we're looking behind us and seeing what has been, and we know it will never be that again. And we can't quite see the future, but we can certainly have a chance at reimagining what we want that future to look like. And so menopause and pandemic time really, to me, spoke to each other in a really interesting way. And it feels like a walk towards wisdom as opposed to a loss of something. It feels mm -hmm. like a gaining, not a losing, which I found quite beautiful. But that realization took me a good number of months to come to and a lot of soul searching and a lot of work as well. I had to do a lot of work to see it as a really positive thing, which mm -hmm. I now do. I think it's amazing. Um, but it was a very scary time when I was going through it and I didn't know what was happening. Mm. I feel I really, I, as I said, that re I mean, I'm, I'm, you're 45 now. Yeah. I'm 42 now and I think I'm, I'm going into that time and um. And I thought, well, maybe it is just the pandemic, just the pandemic, as if mm. everything could. But it's also, it's that thing of maybe it was the pandemic, but also these things, the, the whole perimenopause exacerbates all these things. 
mm. and brings them to the surface and it's sort of um it's an opportunity to face them in a way yeah i think so and i think that we are doing things a bit later as well than previous generations so there's a very good chance that we will be caring for older parents at the same time as caring for younger children and so that adds another layer you know it's multi-layered isn't it and we're lots of we're expected to have lots of different roles and do lots of different things now as women in our 40s um whereas maybe i you know i'm working more than full time many of us so it sort of crashes into a time in our life where it can it can leave sort of i don't know leave you wanting to just stay in bed all day and close the curtains which is what i did mm. effectively until i knew what was happening i was just sitting in the dark in my dressing gown watching back to back first dates and watching women my age run past in their lululemon leggings and thinking why can't i be this woman i'm just sitting here in my dressing gown and it stinks and no i'm not running in my lululemon leggings and I, and and so i i i I could s clearly see what was happening to me after many months of that soul searching, but I didn't see it reflected in what was happening around me. And it's a bit like being pregnant. As soon as I started talking about how I was not fine or what whatsoever, everyone was saying, oh, nor am I. <laughs> I just feel absolutely awful. And aren't those women awful? And I, I don't know how they've got the energy to do it. And I'm just in my dressing gown too. And it felt like a club that I wanted to be part of. It felt like a really honest... Mm -hmm brave falling apart club and a club where we could fall apart together and put each other back together in a new way yeah there are there are there there are two <coughs> things where you you talk you talk a lot about comparing your insides with everybody else's outsides mm. and then there's a really beautiful bit towards the end of the book where you 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 use that term what she doesn't know won't hurt her and you say well actually what we don't know does what does hurt us mm. you know, and it's by sharing and talking to each other about the things you know uh, that, that 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 helps us in so many ways yeah i think so i think that for example my mom describes her menopause as symptomless and again my nan described her menopause as symptomless my mom too yeah and and i, I thought a lot about that and i thought you know are we just a generation of whingers is it just something? <laughs> I don't know. But actually, then, when I started talking to my nan about it, she then started describing symptoms. So she would say symptomless and then say, oh, your granddad used to call me raspberry ripple ice cream because my face went bright red and I was so hot. And I was thinking, well, that's a symptom. Mm. Um, and, you know, there were all sorts of other things happening. So I just think women's language has evolved a little bit. And maybe we're very good at talking now. I worry that we're not so good at listening as perhaps older generations of women. But I'm really glad that we've got the talking part right. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's quite, it's quite interesting. It's, has something changed or are we just talking about it more? I, I'm not sure. I think it's probably the latter. Yeah, yeah. But also the other thing about this book that is, it, there's lots of really great things about this book, but um, you're very frank. Mm. about sexuality mm -hmm. and about the kind of shift inside you so so is this you know a single mum of two mm -hmm. and and how you feel that you need to kind of get out there in the dating arena and of course the more you go through this the more you realize that the love you need is not from someone that your friends introduce you to or someone you meet online but it's from yourself yeah. And that actually all the love you need is all around you with those friendships. And that, that comes to, you know, that comes to be really important to you. But there are some bloody hilarious stories along the way. Hmm. And that was no pun intended. <laughs> you don't have to tell this story. Yeah, I don't want to do any spoilers. But um, <laughs> so essentially, I... If anyone's watching while eating their dinner, put it, put it to yeah, the Yeah, no, I won't, I won't be too graphic um, for the poor Telegraph subscribers um, but no I I went one of the surprising effects of HRT for me because I was expecting that it might lift my mood slightly <laughs> and I might feel a bit like myself back in my own skin and and within about 24 hours I was euphoric and I felt like I I don't know microdosed with magic mushrooms or something and I I also started thinking about sex all the time and I thought oh no I'm now a sex maniac <laughs> 
And I was walking around like an adolescent, what I can only imagine, an adolescent teenage boy, thinking uh, I'm about every two minutes just thinking about sex. And so that was quite an unexpected side effect. And I just imagined that midlife, you know, those feelings of desire <laughs> and sexuality and everything would creep away and da just die. Just die. And yeah. then I could just do gardening. Just get on with your life. But of course, you know, and actually, have you seen Leo, Leo Grand? I no, haven't seen it yet. Oh, it no. was just absolutely brilliant. And of course, those feelings don't go away. But I think probably my any sense of desire or longing or love had had been dampened down with the perimenopause and it's only when it got reawakened in me that I thought actually it is nice to think about those things um and I did go on a quest to uh find somebody I in online dating which was disastrous and there are many examples of numerous disasters in the book because I was looking for love in the wrong places and I didn't realize that I was surrounded by love the whole time mm -hmm. and I'm so blessed with my family with my friends my female friends are as messy and as magic as I am and I just feel so surrounded with love with them and it was when I stopped looking for love obviously that I found it in the end and I don't want to do any spoilers but uh, I did and have someone some that you and, and also not someone you no no so someone I'd known my whole life yeah. but um but yeah it was it I didn't want it to be about that I didn't want it to be about romantic love. I really wanted to talk about the idea of all the different kinds of love that you can experience but essentially this book for me was, a, I won't say learning to love myself because that's still quite hard, but learning to like myself a little bit and that was what perimenopause was about for me. Mm. It was like right time to learn to like yourself a little bit and then everything shifted on that axis mm. um, but that was quite transformational and that came about through therapy as much as HRT in my case. Yeah, it isn't, that is the time, isn't it? It's the when you leave behind all of that. You start to leave behind those insecurities that have dogged so much of your teens and your 20s and your 30s. And you start to realise, I don't know, that everything that you thought you wanted mm. you, or you, that you've been kind of aiming for all these years, you start to question whether you actually do want it or is it just something society has sort of told you? Yeah, that you absolutely. Should have? Absolutely. And I wanted to talk about body image. I wanted to talk about uh, death. You know, there's a chapter about death in there because essentially going through your 40s and having a very turbulent time is a huge privilege. It's a huge privilege. Mm. And so starting to think about that in terms of those things and, and people that I was losing because I was losing people I loved, as, as everyone does when, when you start getting a bit older. And it really gave me a huge dollop of gratitude and perspective, mm. I think, to think, wow, I get to go through peri perimenopause and mm. some women don't. And it is a privilege and it was really, really hard. But actually, the alternative is that you're not here. Yeah. So it is, it is such a privilege. It is such a privilege. I'm welling up. A friend of mine died a few weeks ago at the age of 40. Yeah. And I did think, you know, this is... We, we, we frame aging as such a sort of negative thing and you, yeah. you, 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 you confront that in the book. And that anti-aging industry is worth like millions and millions and millions of pounds mm. and dollars. And, and, but actually, you, 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 don't, you, you do want to age. Yeah, I do want to age. And I, and I just think it's, it's a remarkable that we see aging as such a negative way. And, and particularly, again, with COVID, we saw how ageist we are as a society mm. because elderly people were literally written off and the first to be written off. Mm. And so we just see it as such a negative thing. And yet now I look at older people who I know, lots of friends and my family members, and I just think, wow, you're so wise. You've got so much to offer. And, you know, they're really having a good laugh as well. You know, it's not all doom and gloom. It's amazing. and. It can be amazing, it can be very hard as well, but I'm looking forward to ageing if I get that chance and not everybody gets that chance. And that's the thing to keep in mind, I think, for me the whole time is just have that gratitude that, mm. you know, life is so precarious and it's so precious and it's so fragile and it's so beautiful and it's all the things. I'm feeling all the feelings, Bryony, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling all the feelings and some days I think, oh, this isn't enough, but... You know, it's good. Well, it's I guess really good. we spent the first four decades not fe trying not to yeah, feel things absolutely. We felt ashamed of them mm. or like we shouldn't or it's too much or t not enough. 
Mm. And now it, it's that stage where you go, mm, I, no, no, like my body is literally forcing me to express all of this stuff. Yeah. And the mortality piece. And then now you have to tell the, subs the, the, the people watching the fantastic story. So obviously um, many people will know you for your, your, your beautiful memoir about nursing, language of kindness. And um, you, uh, I want to talk to you a bit about, uh, you know, going to work in the Nightingale Hospital during mm -hmm. the, um, the first lockdown and, and the pandemic. But there's a wonderful story that you tell about working in a care home. Oh, yes. Now, and it's so joyous. Yes. Slightly naughty, but... It is slightly naughty. That the best stories are. Well, it wasn't me being naughty. No. Um, and I've changed the names, so these are, not <laughs> the these are not the real names. Are they even still alive? No, uh, but I've, you know, for, for, for respect for anyone reading, I, these are not real names, but they, it was a true story. And I was working as a health care, well, a carer, while I was a student nurse, so I was probably about 18, so a long, long, long time ago. And again, I had this perception of what it would be like to work with much older people. And some of it was true, you know, lots of people were sitting in the TV room. I felt like they, you know, they were maybe having some fun activities, but it didn't look a whole lot of fun to me being older. And a lot of them had lots of comorbidities and health needs. And there was this one lady I've called Edith, who I just absolutely adored. She always wore leopard print, which I loved anyway. I don't know. <laughs> and, um, we she, didn't plan to match. Tonight. We didn't plan. We just, well, we just match anyway. Uh, but she always wore bright red lipstick. She had this sort of shock of white hair, and she threw herself into every activity with gusto. So whatever was going on, bingo, quiz, Zumba. They did a sort of early Zumba evening, and she twisted her ankle, so everyone was quite worried about her. And then the next night, she had there was a sort of quiz, and there were two men that I've called Frank and Gareth in the book. <laughs> And they were very quiet men uh, who had a lot of care needs, but they won the quiz with Edith. And I remember just watching them and the joy and the happiness and thinking, oh, that's lovely. And then I did the tea round at the end of the night and knocked on Edith's door and she didn't answer the door. And I started panicking, thinking anything could happen. You know, she might have had a fall. She might have died it, who knows what's going to happen she was very 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 old and um very frail actually and so i was really shouting for help i was panicking and eventually i got her door open and she wasn't dead and she hadn't had a fall she was actually semi-naked in bed with frank and gareth who were also semi-naked <laughs> and I, at the time, was horrified, Bryony. <laughs> I literally ran. I was absolutely horrified. And now I think if I could go back, I'd just say, well done, Edith. Go for it, Edith. Go for it, Edith. You do you. And, you know, she was <laughs> having fun. And family. Frank and Gareth. But it really shocked me. And Frank and Gareth. <laughs> yeah, um, it really shocked me. But then I realised that, you know, older people do have a sex life. They do. <laughs> they do. Sometimes, like Edith's, I think that was quite extreme. But, um, yeah, it was quite funny. No judgment here. No judgment. Um, to get serious for, uh, for a little bit, you, mm -hmm. l let's talk about um, COVID. You went back to um, work uh, in the Nightingale Hospital and it's a, it's a really moving um, pass passage in the book. Uh, about the experience of that and at the very beginning, not knowing, you know, the fear. Yeah not knowing what was happening, but also how it gave you a sort of, again, it was very much part of the, um, part of the, the moment where you realized how precious life was. And of mm. course you, you know this as a nurse, do you know what I mean? But it was, it was such an extraordinary time kind of coinciding with being on HRT and all that. Can you just talk a bit about your experience? Yeah, I mean, it's really surreal already. I, I, I think that, I haven't processed it like everyone. And I was only I was only going back for the first peak of the pandemic, so it was a very short time. It was a matter of weeks, a couple of months. Um, but obviously I didn't expect to be working clinically as a nurse. And when when COVID happened, my friends started texting me and say, saying, you know, the early days when we didn't really know how serious it was, started saying, oh, are you going back um, to clinical work? And I was like, well, only if the, if the world is about to end, joking, ha ha. And then, of course, 
everyone got the call, can you please go back, the world is about to end, that's how it felt. And it was terrifying, Bryony, I can't even, I can't even tell you how terrifying it was because essentially it was like that sort of 21 days later thing where the roads were completely empty and there were just signs everywhere, stay home, stay home, and, and, and we were the, uh, sort of going to work, the only people out really. And I think most healthcare workers, I'm sure, had the same thought that I did, which is that we could die. Mm -hmm. And so it was absolutely terrifying. But the thing that was amazing and the thing that made me do it, and I'm sure um, other colleagues would say the same, is the teamwork. And because it, it's something more than just colleagues, it's like friendship, family, everything rolled into one where, you, you know, I had the chance to stand alongside these absolutely incredible human beings who were literally running towards danger and sacrificing so much for the sake of strangers. Mm -hmm. And I just thought they were absolutely incredible human beings. And they worked throughout the whole thing. I was, I was retired, so came, rolled out, and then went back into sort of clinical retirement. But there are people who are still right now today in the heat that we've had today and the next week working on intensive care wards with COVID patients for 12 and a half hours in PPE and they've done it for two and a half years now and it's astonishing to me that human beings have that capacity mm. to be able to do it so although it was a terrifying scary thing to do I, I felt really proud to for a very short time stand alongside these incredible humans. You talk about the um, the intensive care wards during that time, mm. um, and and just how it it was it was not just that you'd never seen anything like this before, but it was you'd literally never seen anything like this before in terms of the patients. They, you know, they had to they were lying prone. Mm. It was it, it was extraordinary. And then you would come home and you would shout up the stairs. I'm home, go to your bedrooms, to your two children. Mm. And then you would take all your clothes off, put them on a boil wash, get in the shower, wash your hair. Yeah. And then you would allow them out. And of course now we're all living at this time, you know, as you said, you, you, you kind of nailed it there. Like you still haven't processed it. And I think that's, that's the case for lots of people, even <coughs> those of us who weren't working in intensive care or yeah. we've sort of moved ourselves through it and like, oh, it's done now, let's move on. Mm. But that, was, that, that must have been incredibly traumatic. I think it was incredibly traumatic and guilt laden and all, all the things, but it was such a dehumanizing time, wasn't it? When you're talking about prone, you know, the patients were face down, so there were no faces. The staff had PPE on and masks on, so there were no faces of staff. You couldn't hear anything because the alarms were so loud, so there were no voices, no faces. We were doing sign language because really? we couldn't hear. So we were teaching basic sign language. Um, and so you didn't have any, anything that made us human. And so for me, one of the most impressive things wasn't actually the saving lives of which we did our best, but obviously nowhere near as many lives were saved that everyone wanted in those early days before we really understood what, what we were dealing with. But people were, putting up photographs and contacting families and video calling home and prioritizing those details that make us human mm. so that you know I mean the person in bed five wasn't just a person in bed five it was a person who had grandchildren who liked to play golf whose wife had been on the phone the day before and it was those details that just I think really helped the staff as much as the families of the mm. patients get through it just to remember you know we, it could be any one of us in that bed and any, any any one of us at any time and so it kind of made it slightly easier but yeah it was pretty terrifying and and the coming home and scrubbing everything down and yeah just just in the shower every day just thinking please please don't let me pass this on to the kids as I'm sure everyone felt, and some people, some of my colleagues were living in the ho living in the nearby hotels because they just didn't, they couldn't, fit, couldn't go home to risk that. You, you talk, you you know, you <coughs> you talk about sort of mortality a lot and realizing your own mortality and, and losing mm. friends as you get older, but there was also, you know, you, you've obviously experienced a, a lot of death in in your in your occupation. You know, that's sort of 
But one of the things that, you know, you talk about the dehumanizing aspects of COVID. And I think the thing that really makes people angry when they, you know, look back on all that's happened and political mm. events and whatnot is that, you know, people just had to die alone and there was no, you know, the, the process of death is really important. It's really important that people get to say goodbye. And, mm. and, and of course, that couldn't happen. But there were really moving bits in the book where you talk about the kind of touches of that people would the, the the nurses would make can you can you talk about that yeah I, I i mean where i worked we were lucky we were allowing visitors in to be with family members at the end of their life and we really fought for that to happen um but that wasn't across the board mm -hmm. in the uk in the nhs and and i feel like we were living through a time, I, I think my role changed so many times, but in the end I was lead nurse for compassionate care. And I kept thinking about that word compassion and what it means. And I just thought, regardless of saving lives or not, history will judge us about on how compassionate we are at this time to each other. And it should judge us on how compassionate we are. And I really felt very strongly that and, you know, nobody would be on their own at the end of their life because there would be a nurse or somebody with them. But that's not the same as a family member. Mm. And I think one of the things that we got very, very wrong was not allowing family members to be with loved ones. I feel like that was uh, just the most traumatising thing I can ever imagine. And I think we will look back and say that that was a really bad thing that we did. We mm. didn't get that right. And of course, it came from very good reasons. Retrospect is a great thing. We were so worried about the virus and everyone catching it. But that is a, it's chilling, isn't it? To think that that happened to so many families that they couldn't be there at the end of their loved one's life. And um, yeah, I don't think anyone's quite processed that now and yet. You, you touch on working <coughs> in a hospital that Boris Johnson was, was brought into when he was suffering from COVID and they mm. kind of, very mixed feelings there. What now we are, you know, obviously he's, I don't want to get too like political, but why not? Um, he's just resigned. What do you make of, uh, you know, when you when you heard about the parties and I know we kind of, there's a temptation to go, oh, let's just put it behind us now. But that process, you know, how as someone who was actually working at that time, you know, in full PPE with people seriously ill, how does that make you but what was, what's, what are your sort of feelings about the whole thing? So I think, I mean, work aside, I felt like I was very, I, I had COVID very badly very early on before the vaccines, but I felt like I'd um, not had anywhere near as terrible experience as, as lots and lots of people that I know who have lost loved ones, very, very close loved ones. And I have lost people, but not direct close family. And so I think all of those things that happened I just kept thinking about those people that weren't allowed to have a funeral or weren't allowed to be with their person at the end of their life and I would imagine that putting myself in their shoes that just must have been really really difficult to to watch and live through but I was you know I, f I feel I was nowhere near one of those people just just having worked there I think people had such a terrible time, much, much worse than I did. And I can only imagine that, you know, they're watching this political show happen at the moment and just have really, really difficult feelings about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You did have, you know, you say that you didn't have a hard time, but there was, you had a really frightening experience with your daughter. Mm. Can you talk a bit about that? Because you yeah. touch on that in the book. Yeah, so she, um, she's a dancer and she has never missed dance since she was two years old. And she, uh, I, I woke up in, in the morning and she was late for her dance and I went into her bedroom and shouted at her, you know, normal standard parenting, come on, get up, blah, blah, blah. And she said, mum, I can't, I can't get up. And I was just looking at her and I just thought, she doesn't look quite right. And she said, uh, I said, come on, get up, get up, you're going to be late. And she said, I can't stand, I can't stand up. And I went over to her and I felt her head and I could feel the heart before I even got to her head. And so assumed COVID, she's got COVID. And she ended up in, um, she ended up in uh, A&E by that evening and she was really, really, really very poorly and her blood pressure was very, very low and they had to give her lots and lots of fluid. 
And at that time, they thought she had a post-viral version of COVID called right. PIMS TS, which I'd never heard of. Um, and they were very, very worried about her heart. And so she kept having scan after scan after scan. And it was a terrifying, terrifying couple of weeks. And they eventually found that she had urosepsis. She had sepsis. And she got very, very sick very, very quickly. But she got better very, very, very quickly as well. So again, we just felt huge gratitude and, and just to be blessed. But at that time, initially, I thought I'd given her Mm -hmm. I thought I'd brought home COVID and then she was sort of on the edge of life. So it was absolutely petrifying. Um, yeah, horrible. And again, I don't think I've really quite processed that now. But that was probably every, every parent's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. And having been a paediatric intensive care nurse, I, I'd always assumed that I could be empathetic and walk a mile in someone's shoes and really try and imagine how things felt. But absolutely not until I was on that other side of the fence and there's no darkness in the universe like the darkness of the possibility that your child might not survive. I mean, it just, it just was the most all-consuming, terrifying thought ever. Um, and she's luckily, and thank goodness, she's absolutely fine. Yeah, yep. the other thing, thank, thank <coughs> I'm so glad she's better. But the other thing that you touched on is that you're, you know, <coughs> that thing that so often happens in families of your your home hormones being on the on the yeah on the, uh, on the down and obviously then you've got a teenage daughter and she decides she wants to change her name mm. and she's exploring her identity and stuff and the sort of this that is a huge part of perimenopause for a lot of women the sort of bumping up against yeah your flesh and blood who you know you love dearly and then suddenly a sort of slightly at odds with yeah, and it's really interesting because I was saying things to her and then I was thinking, I'm not taking that advice myself at all. <laughs> so I was saying, oh, you know, you need to be really, you know, body positive and just be really proud of who you are and don't start scrolling on Instagram. And then I was sort of secretly <laughs> scrolling on Instagram and going off and having like a full Hollywood because I found three grey pubic hairs and, you know, horrendous stuff myself. But then saying to her, oh, you know, you're fabulous, blah, blah, blah. And so she was kind of, well, she is kind of more mature than I am. And that's a weird place to be in, mm -hmm. I think, as well. Yeah. Because, of course, she's forming her identity and I'm reforming my identity at the same time. And it does feel like a second adolescence, which is what they call it in France, second adolescence. It to um, Do you know what? The, the moment I, the, the, well, when I realised, I thought maybe this, this is something mm. hormonal, was that I'd started to develop crushes on popular <laughs> figures <laughs> in, the way, in the way that I did when I was uh, when I was when I was a teenager and I yeah. was like in love with Take That and, and I became I found myself properly obsessed with Lin-Manuel Miranda <laughs> and I don't know why I'm admitting this <laughs> this is brilliant and then and then and then it moved on to Sam Fender who's like half my age but it was like a proper like love like lo like oh I'll never get together with him. No, of course you won't, Bryony. You're 42, and you're also married. But um, but it's that it's that stuff of like the feelings. I was like, I felt this way before when I was 13 and in love with Robbie Williams. Yeah, <laughs> I was in love with Robbie Williams as well. But yeah, have you got a poster of Sam Fender up anywhere? No, you haven't gone no, that far. No, he's just my screensaver. I'm <laughs> joking. No, no, he's no, no. We did go and see him last week. My husband was like, okay. Oh, brilliant. No, but, it's, it. but it was the same, you know, obviously, seri I, I don't seriously entertain thoughts of running away from my husband with Sam Fender, only like half the time. Yeah. But it was just <laughs> that knowledge of this intensity of feeling is is familiar and I'd forgotten about it. No. Yeah. It's quite, that's quite exciting though, isn't it? That's quite, <laughs> it's a bit more I, mental. I think it's mental and exciting and all the things. I think that's quite nice. Yeah, I think that's that's the part where you're losing, uh, not your mind, but uh, your <laughs> there's a bit of fair amount uh, of that. But yeah, I think that's the bit where you know you're you're not caring as much about external things, the cult of youth mm. and external beauty and what people think about you and what you might have said two weeks ago to somebody in a conversation, and you kind of just feel a bit girl-like again, mm. and when you're postmenopausal, your hormones drop down to the level pre-puberty, not gone, just how they were pre-puberty. 
And so I'm fascinated by my much older friends who are grandmas playing with their granddaughters and watching them and thinking, actually, mm. there's a synergy here that they're both finding great delight and just joy and magic in these small things that have nothing to do with validation, mm. just nature and magic. And it's really quite nice, I think. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of questions here from, okay. from people watching and I haven't, um, uh, there's, I'm going to, so if, and you can still uh, submit them uh, via the little bit box at the bottom, that is the technical t uh, phrase for it. Um, so, oh, here's a good question. How did you find a therapist who understood what was happening to you? Well, that is a very good question and uh, I, um, I had never had therapy before and I looked for a therapist and I went to about three or four different therapists to meet them and see if it was going to be a good fit mm -hmm. and I found this therapist who uh, was amazing and it was only looking back that I thought ah she was the only one out of the four therapists who was a much older woman a much older much wiser woman but I think that must have been subconscious on my part I must have been searching for someone who was on the other side of this hump. And mm. But she very quickly said perimenopause. It could have gone very differently because if she hadn't recognised that, then I might have had a very different experience because I wouldn't have thought to go to my GP, mm. to be honest. Did you find your GP was um, helpful? <laughs> I did. Again, I was really lucky. And I've heard some horror, horror stories. But my GP was amazing and just very quickly said, I think it's perimenopause too, let's try low dose HRT and if it doesn't work, you can come off it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, blood test? And she was like, well, you know, maybe, but not essential. Um, yeah, and she was absolutely incredible. So I think all, also, I, I do worry that GPs get such a bad rap for yeah. every single thing. And most of them they are They are like the brilliant. whipping boys and girls, yeah. aren't they, of the NHS? They really are. And they're doing such an incredibly difficult job at the moment, particularly. Um, and I'm sure there are horror stories, and it is good to talk about training and things like that. But my experience was very good. And the therapy was something that I, you know, I couldn't really afford, but I couldn't afford not to. Yeah. And that was where I was. And Sound investment. Oh, it was just life changing. It really was. Hmm. And I just thought, why didn't I do this when I was 20? So, but because, got there in the end. well, this is the thing. But yeah. because I suppose, so you would definitely recommend a good course of therapy alongside HRT? HLT. Yes, I do. And I don't even recommend HRT necessarily. Really? Yeah. I, I think that every woman has got their own choice to make with that, as long as she's armed with the information. And the information is the important bit. Mm -hmm. But not every woman needs HRT. You know, there's lots and lots of different other treatments. And some women don't need any kind of medical treatment. But I would say therapy, if you can, if you have got access to it. And it's a privilege, isn't it, to be able to access therapy. It is an absolute it's privilege. It's a huge privilege. But if you have got access and means to do it, then I would just say it's, it's a really good time of life to be digging into what's going on. And also consciously walking into the choices that you make for the next part of your life mm. as well. Mm. Um, th uh, there's now this. I've got to ask this question because it's it's got also received quite a lot of likes. Why do you think women have their pubic hair waxed? I can't think of anything more painful. <laughs> okay, how many child many, childbirth. That's how many quite likes? painful. How many likes? I d d we mustn't get obsessed <laughs> with likes. Okay, so um, <laughs> it was horrifically painful, um, and I the the only reason at all was just vanity <laughs> where I just thought oh my goodness my body's changing I don't recognize it I'm just going to get a full Hollywood I don't know what I was thinking full Hollywood <laughs> but it was very undignified um, I, I won't go into graphic detail because people might be eating their dinner or something <laughs> like that and all I will say is uh, my full Hollywood days are behind me right for sure Okay, so on a more serious note, uh, I just threw that one in because it's fun and I like a bit of fun. You know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta bring the dark, with the light with fun. the dark. Yeah. Um, so, so someone said, I have my daughter at thirty-nine. She's now fourteen. I've been through perimenopause and definitely menopausal now. How do I hope us help? Sorry, pardon me. How do I help us both navigate this hormonal challenge? 
Gosh, I, w I wish I could give you like sound advice. <laughs> I don't know if you've, you've got sound advice as well, Brian. Oh, I don't. Better advice I mean, than I, do. I, I don't know. Because yeah, my daughter is going into that phase. Yeah, and it's, yeah. I'm, I just feel for my husband stuck between us. Yeah, I, I think I think having good friends around for both of you is really important. Encouraging friendships for her and for you. And then also, I just think some days are going to be horrendous. And that's okay. That's mm -hmm. normal. I think knowing that some days are just going to be really, really difficult. But, you know, sometimes parent, parenting is just hanging on, isn't it? It is. And I think we don't give enough, you know, I think we think it should, we're failing mm. if it's not kind of always perfect. But I think the other beautiful thing about this stage of life is that, you know, we took, you hear a lot about inner child work and reparenting. And I think the opportunity now, I feel, is to give my daughter the kind of love and patience that perhaps I didn't receive when I was her age, which was not the fault of my parents at all. It was more the fault of society mm. and the fact that we, weren't, we didn't speak about mental health and all that jazz. And there is, a, there, is a re there is a real kind of empathy that cuts through it. I mean, at times you are just like, mm. but, you know, actually just to share those moments and, and, do, and reparent, you know, reparent yourself by, by parenting your child. I've, I've gone a bit woo-woo here. Yeah, it's like Gwyneth, you're like Gwyneth Paltrow all of a sudden, but I hear what you're saying. <laughs> I just think, but yeah, I feel like I'm in goop. <laughs> I'm like a really, really <laughs> no, bad I version think, of no, goop. I think... Uh, I'm like an Aldi version of goop. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Aldi version of goop. I think... We should start it. Let's do it. We are going to take over the world. You know what? There's a market for this. There I is. Think. Yeah. Low, 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 low rent. Low rent goop. Yeah. This is good. Um, I think that with my daughter particularly, I don't know about you, but I, I just try and be my authentic, messy, chaotic, badly organised self who gets things wrong and makes massive mess, mess of things sometimes. And I just, I show her who I am and I'm really truthful and honest, even if it's really, really difficult, because I want her to be able to bring her authentic, honest, true self to me and say, mum, I made a massive mess of X, Y and Z. Mm. And sometimes she just wants to say, don't <laughs> tell me anything else. But I, I really think that that's helped us, actually, over the last few years. More honesty. Yeah. Um, this is another good one. Do you have any top tips for male partners of women who have recently been, been diagnosed as menopausal, assuming they're already on HRT? I think that's a really good one. And actually, I've had a lot, a lot of men contact me about the book and say, this was so helpful for me because I had no idea what uh, my wife, my partner, my girlfriend was going through. Um, I think it is again about information, don't you? I think mm. it's about arming yourself with as much information as possible and um, because if, if women are only just learning about perimenopause like <laughs> me, then men certainly don't know about it yet. Yeah. And it must be really traumatic mm. to have somebody totally change their personality almost overnight when you don't know what's happening or going on. Or going on. Mm. Um, but I think it's about information, getting, getting information and getting support yourself as well, because it must be hard. Any tips on what not to say if your other half is going through menopause? I think the how, I, I think, are you all right? How are you? Are you all right? How are you? Or like, you know, are you, are you having a hot flush or are you, it, it almost a bit like when, you, when you're having a period, are you on your period? <laughs> You know, almost like, are you oh, feeling hormonal it's just, today? It's just that. It's just that. But yeah, I, I, just think, I just think a huge dollop of understanding. And also the back to that brutal honesty thing where if things are difficult and you're struggling uh, in any direction, just to have that open communication and say, this is really hard, how can I support you? What can I do? Rather than guessing. Um, uh, Katie Goddard has asked, she's one of the few people to include her name, um, funnily enough the, the, the waxing person was anonymous, um, <laughs> is the book relatable for women in their late 50s, me, um, who have been through menopause or is it solely aimed at women experiencing the perimenopause? So this book is not really about perimenopause, it's a bit of a red herring, <laughs> it's really about finding meaning in life and friendship and love and so I think because I'm in the perimenopause phase obviously mm. that was one of the kind of story arcs that I use but I really hope it's relevant to people of all age a lot of it is about 
much older women, actually, particularly mm. towards the second half of the book. Um, so hopefully it's relevant to that particular person. Sorry I've gone, so. Up so much, so gone so much. The, the, the menopause thread throughout it obviously was what resonated with me. No, definitely, definitely. And it is about, of course, it is about perimenopause. But I think, I hope, I hope it's relevant to older women. It's, it's, a, it's a very um, positive, I suppose, look at my future and look at my friends who are much older and uh, much wiser than I am. But I hope to be one day. <laughs> you are very wise. Um, a couple of kind of um, advice questions. Uh, Donna asks, my dentist has recently told me I need a denture and I'm not coping with the notion at all well. Any advice, please help. Wow, okay. Um, apparently, perimenopause really affects your gums and your teeth as well, actually. It I does. was in there, you start getting bleeding gums and all sorts. I think I've got a false tooth there, uh, which was from a very interesting tennis injury. So I've got a denture at the front, Donna, and it's never affected my life, is all I'd say, <laughs> at <Okay>. all, <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess it's back to that thing about, you know, it, it's all very well saying that we're going to be very grateful for our lives and very put, have a lot of perspective about recent events. But when something like that happens to you, it's really, really hard. Mm. And I mean, you'll know from alopecia and things like that, my hair was falling out. Those things can really, really affect you. So yeah, your body does become sort of slightly alien. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So you can hold two things at once. You could be worried about the big things and grateful. And you can also be really annoyed that you've got three gravy, gravy big hairs or <laughs> this is the thing that really came through um in this book is the ability to hold more than one thing you mm. know which i think is i don't know i mean maybe it is a fe just a female thing but maybe i'm just you know i'm generalizing and this is also something men men experience but it's that thing you cannot you're either happy or you're sad or you're this or you're that but you can't be more than one thing and of course there's a duality of, of this of, of this time of life and of this book is that it you know at first it's scary and confusing to you but essentially at the same time it's also massively liberating yeah yeah and you could be lots of different things at once yeah you can be chaotic and badly organised and you can also be a professional who's very wise. You know, you can be all sorts of things. And women are. Mm. We are like a quilt. And I, and I, when they designed the cover, it was an actual quilt. In, they got a quilter to make it. Um, because oh, I love really? the idea of a patchwork quilt. Our lives are made up of, quilt, of patchwork, different areas of our lives. And I thought the most interesting thing about the quilt that they made wasn't the front where it was all beautiful. It was the threads underneath. And it was the bit of the back of the quilt where all the work has gone into it and everything's a massive mess. But that's what we're like, mm. you know, everything underneath the surface and all of us are these threads coming undone and put back together and looking a bit strange. And recognising that we're all like that, um, I think, has is, is been a bit of a revelation. Acceptance of that. Acceptance, yeah. Um, uh, one last question. Um, I want to include my partner's widowed mother on a night out. She's a very jolly person, but it mustn't seem contrived. Any ideas? I don't know if you've got any ideas for this one. <laughs> well, I think if she's a very jolly person... Ask her. Just ask her. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You know, ask her who she's got a, a crush on. <laughs> what artist? <laughs> yeah. Could be Sam Fender. I can guarantee you a good night out for a Sam Fender concert. Exactly. I that. Exactly. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, maybe. I think also it's that thing we can we can get all sort of up in arms about death and 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 people who are widowed and actually what they were just and, and to the point that we, I've ha I have a friend who lost his wife a few years ago and he said at first everyone was there like but then they sort of fell away after the funeral mm. and I think a lot of the time they. You know, they, people were sort of scared mm. to, you know, maybe I'll say the wrong thing. And actually what he wants is company and friendship. And it doesn't, you know what I mean? It, 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 just to be asked is really nice. Yeah, and I think that's it. I think whatever you're doing, if you just ask this person every time, it might be that one thing appeals to them and another thing doesn't. And eventually, sometimes if you keep asking, someone will say, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll come out and have a laugh.
at a Sam Fender concert. At a Sam Fender concert. Um, if anyone wants to invite me to a Sam Fender concert, you know you can <laughs> find me at briny.gordon at telegraph.co.uk. That's just a joke. It's not really a joke. I have a question for you, Christy. Okay, brilliant. Uh, in the book, very close to the beginning, you say um, you, you say that non as as someone who's written both non-fiction and fiction, non-fiction contains fact, but fiction to you is truth. Mm. So you've written two novels. This is your third memoir. Yeah. Tell me, and I said, again, if I ask you which do you prefer, it's like you can like both of them in different ways. So that's mm. a bit of a lame question that I won't ask. But what next? What do you? What what what's next from Chrissy Watson, and where are we going to go? More nonfiction. But so I would like to write fiction next. Um, I think I've had enough of fact. And also, I kind of feel a bit of a fraud writing all these memoirs, you know. <laughs> I just feel like everyone's had enough now. Um, but I also love... I the, haven't had enough. Oh, I love the process of writing fiction, though, and I know you're, you're writing fiction as well. And I, I just... Non-fiction is more challenging for me in lots of ways because I'm rubbish at planning and scaffolding and the architecture of the thing, which you need in non-fiction. And fiction is just, for me, a, it's a losing yourself for a year or two falling apart and then coming back and so basically it's like being in the perimenopause mm -hmm. um, I'm going into this fire of fiction hopefully and I'm also writing uh, or working with a television production company who, are, who have bought who've optioned it and are hoping to make Quilt on Fire, Quilt on fire. yeah so a bit of TV stuff as well hopefully coming and will you adapt that I think that it's too early to say, you know, development for TV is a long process and I'm doing a few different things, but definitely TV writing will be on the cards at some point, which is really exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. It's nice. And also the knowledge that you've got the whole of the rest of your life ahead of you. Mm. You can do anything you want. Yeah, well, hopefully. Um, yeah, I'd like to take a holiday as well. Have we, have we, what about... <laughs> I don't mean to, you know, ask, I don't mean to like, obviously this book is about f loving yourself yeah, yeah. and exploring that, but it does, you know, you do hint at a slightly, you know, happy ending Yes. with Bible Ben. I yes. don't want to give any more away there, yes. but is that all? Bible Ben is the loveliest person in the world. And his name's not really Bible Ben, but he's the <laughs> loveliest person no. in the world. And yeah, we met when we were three years old. So outside my family, he's the person I've known the longest, who obviously I didn't give the time of day to <laughs> at all. But there you go. That's a kind of side little teaser of, <laughs> of, 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 of book number six. No, it's not book number six. He'll be watching, so don't worry, Bible Ben. It's not book number six. I'm done. <laughs> How do you... I, I remember that we, we do have to wrap up soon, unfortunately. I could just sit here talking to you all night, to be honest. Um, but how do you navigate that thing with people? Cause, because you write non-fiction, you mm. write memoir, um, with friends or, you know, par partners or mm. family members about... Do they kind of think, oh, are you going to write about me? Do you, and do you then say... I, I, I always check with, for example, anything about my children. I would run through it with them, talk to them about it, read them it, make sure they're okay with the wording, etc., etc. And they always just say, Mum, we just don't care. None of our friends will ever read any of this. <laughs> and so it's really weird because I always get really anxious about it. And they're just like, we do not care. Um, and so I always think people are... Are worried about that and I just don't think they are. <laughs> do they do your kids read your books? No they're not interested in the slightest. <laughs> I mean even the bits that they're in, really? even the acknowledgements in this book is for them and I had to read it aloud to them and they, and they were just yeah great. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't worry too much but what I do find that's really difficult is people that don't know me who think that they know me and I know that's just part and parcel of being a memoirist because you're showing a little bit of yourself but obviously yeah. Strangers then, obviously, un Off understandably, you. think that they know you. And, and so it's quite weird when people start talking to you like an old friend and you're thinking, do I know you? <laughs> and then you think, no, I don't know. You've just read a couple of books. And so it feels like you've got a lot of friends in the world, but some of them you don't recognise. Yeah. <laughs> that's also yeah. really nice. It's really nice. And it's a testament to your writing that people feel that, um, feel that they know you. Mm. You know, that's the joy. You, you are that just there, Christy, on the page. Do you know what I mean? And it's, and it's lovely and you're funny and you're moving. And this is a 
fantastic book. This is a proof. I need to get a proper hardback copy. Um, and if you want to get, I'm not talking, you've obviously got copies because I've you wrote one. the book. <laughs> but if you want to get a copy of Quilt on Fire, you will be emailed and it's, I think, and this is very professional of me, isn't it? An exclusive code giving you 20% off, I think, tomorrow. And you will also um, be able to rewatch this. I hope that's the case. If not, I'm, I'm a massive apology. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, thank you so much, Christy, oh, for you. coming along tonight and sharing all about your messy magic of midlife. It's made me feel honestly a lot better i've had a bit of a day today and you've completely lifted my spirits and oh. my heart more than any hrt can sure. um do get the book if you haven't already thank you so much it's a joy to see you absolute joy and thank you everyone for coming along thank you